standing here with my cane. Sometimes when you see somebody with a disability, you feel sorry for them. Oh, the poor guy. Poor me. And sometimes when you have a disability, you happen to say, poor me. Well, I went through my blindness thing. I was never always blind. I was an athlete in high school, college. I went blind in my early 20s and took it to my 30s, early 30s, to go completely blind. Had lots of anger issues. Sound familiar? Made it the world. I punched punching bags. I lifted weights, pumped iron, became an incarcerated criminal mind, incarcerated in my mind, imprisoned person, psychologically, working out, pumping iron, and anger, and didn't realize that I was actually getting in shape for the next chapter of my life. But I was too busy being angry to know. I wanted to be a teacher since I was three years old. Now this chain sometimes makes you, makes you feel sorry for someone. But when you get to hear what I've done, what you're going to be able to do in your life, you realize this came out of short. I don't know what that was, but it felt good. Uh, and it makes you travel around the world. So let me put this down. Now so I'll take my cane and put it up at the time. Maybe it's possible a bit later. So that's my cane. I definitely pulled the line. I can't see you. But anyhow, you still look good. My life as a teacher began when I was three years, three years old, I wanted to be a teacher. My mother took my older brother to kindergarten, and she took me along for the ride because I was three. And here I am holding my mother's arm, walking to school. My brother went in the classroom, and you know my brother's 65 years old now, 64 rather. He never really liked school that much. From the first day he went in, till now really, but he, you know, he's turned over a little bit. But he went into the kindergarten classroom, screamed, started crying, and ran out. And by the way, he threw up on my mother's shoes on the way out the door. And he literally did. And I went in the classroom and saw all the kids, toys, clay, free cookies. I was jacked up. I went in the classroom and I was playing with all the kids. And my mother said, it's time to leave. I started crying because I wanted to stay. My brother was screaming and crying because he wanted to leave. He had my mother's arm pulling her this way. I had her arm pulling her that way. She looked like a turkey bone at Thanksgiving. We're making a wish. I wanted to be a teacher since I was three years old. When I went through my teenage years in high school, I was in a future teacher's camp. I love teaching because I love kids. I still love kids. I'm a grandfather now, and my little grandson has little prints on his head from all the kids his grandfather gives him. I love it, man. It's great having a kid. And a grandson, my goodness. So I always want, I'm a big kid. I'm 60, going to be 62 years old. Right now I feel like I'm 16 again. Because whenever I'm around young folks, I feel young. That's the great thing about teaching. It keeps you young. The great thing about being a parent, you get to live life all over again with your kids and get to do all the things with them that you never did yourself. It looks like you're being good to your kids for them. You're just doing it yourself. You want to go on the roller coaster, but you don't want to tell them about it. And when your grandson comes, forget it. You're going over little rides and have all fun and buy snow cones. Would you like a kid ice cream cone? No. Yes, you do. Because grandma wants that. <laughs> and you have this ice cream cone. How about a peanut butter cup? Don't give him that. Okay, I'll eat it. Okay. So you have fun when you get I love kids, you can tell. Well, when I went to high school, went to college, I went to Montclair State. I wanted to be a teacher, biology teacher. I taught for 30 years at Bell High School. I've been retired for 11 years. Due to man, that makes me older than Methuselah. But I, I had my whole life get interrupted when my eyesight started going away. You see, I was an athlete. And I was a pretty good athlete. I hate to brag, but I was a good athlete. I was the kind of guy that batted cleanup on the team. I was the kind of guy that played basketball, got 25 points in the game. I was the kind of guy that played football and could throw a bomb 60 yards in the air. I mean, I was good. But then I started, and I was a javelin thrower, which is a big old spear. That's my old ancient cannibal ancestry inside me. I love throwing spears, even if there's no people around. But I was a spear chucker, javelin thrower in college, and I was pretty good. I made the national qualifications for the championships for Division Three. And then something happened. My eyesight started going away. Dr. Hockey's father and I were good friends back in college. 
through high school and college, we're still friends today. He saw me transition from a sighted athlete to a guy who's struggling to sit. When you're a guy, or a gal, it doesn't matter now, if you're athletic and you can't do athletics anymore, it's like ripping your heart out, especially when you're young. When you're 82 years old and you can't go bowling anymore, like who cares? But when you're young, that was part of what you carried on your sleeve. I'm an athlete. I couldn't do it anymore. My heart was breaking. So from the early 20s, here I was a guy in a softball team that used to be in a men's fast pitch league, back cleanup, couldn't even hit a beach ball. Couldn't even catch a basketball when he passed it to me and went through my hands like I was some dog. Couldn't shoot anything. I couldn't do anything. My heart was breaking. Got married, 26, 27 years old, started losing my eyesight. A couple of years later, cheated on me, left just when I was going blind, totally broke. I was having a rough air day. I was teaching a few years, that was my solace. That was my, my way of just pouring myself into another world that I love, teaching. And now that seemed like it might be taken away from me. And I want you to know, when people think they're gonna take something away from you, if folks think that you can never do anything, that you'll never be a success in life, if anybody's ever told you, you'll never amount to anything. I'm sure some of us have heard those words. You're just a troublemaker. You're just no good. You're just not this. You'll never be able. I had my first principal tell me that I was the worst teacher he ever saw in 42 years in the evaluation. I wanted to be a teacher my whole life. My first job, my first evaluation said I was a piece of crap. That made me feel really good. But I remember that. And by the way, and after that, I continued teaching and then went blind. So I remember my first scouting report on my first evaluation said, Mr. Ruffalo is the worst teacher that I've ever seen in 42 years. Thank you very much. Now I could have choked that guy or proved him wrong. I decided to do the latter. He said I was the worst teacher in the world. Let's see about that. I want you to think the same thing. When people say you can't do something, you have every reason to fail, let that be your reason for success. So I went to my second teaching assignment in Belleville, started in 1974, taught there to 2002, when Nepal and I had a meeting in Nepal 1. Knocked me out of teaching. I love teaching. I taught for 25 years, totally blind. Didn't miss one sick day when the world says I'm disabled, because that's how much I love teaching. In 1981, I went to my principal's office to tender my resignation. Because I was going blind back then, and my whole life was falling apart. You know what he did? He said, we'll get you somebody, a teacher assistant, to assist you and help you. No different than some of you folks here at Shepherd. You get a little help from your teachers, which are your life's coaches. And by the way, listen to the coaches. The best golfer in the world, Tiger Woods, still has a golf coach. LeBron James still has a shooting coach. The best batters in the world still have hitting coaches. Guess what? We all need coaches. Listen to the rules, follow the rules, listen to the recipe, and you'll make a wonderful brownie out of your life. You mix the recipe wrong, it tastes terrible. But listen to the coach. They'll make a success out of you, like it or not. That's why we're here. We want you in the end zone, and we want to win. So you're fortunate that you're here at the school, that you have special needs that are being addressed, and you have special expert coaches that are going to help you make it to the next level. I was blind, worst teacher in the world, and now you're going to hear the rest of the story. I became an international athlete after 11 or 12 years of angrily punching a heavy bed for 45 minutes a day and lifting weights and pumping iron and doing thousands of push-ups. I found out about blind sports. I represented the United States of America. My anger went away, and now I felt like somebody. You see, the thing that I hated, and still hate today, blindness, I decided to conquer. Instead of running from it, I decided to stare it down. Instead of having fear of the unknown, I made the unknown blindness known, and the fear went away. What I have to share with you is I then worked hard, trained hard. I'm not a great athlete, but I'll train harder than anybody you know. And I won 14 international gold medals, broke nine world records, four different titles, and four different events, and six world championships, and coached three World Cup powerlifting teams to gold medals, 26 international medals, 32 national championships, 15 national records, 
and I won 13 state titles against sighted competitors, and that was being blind, one hand tied behind my back, because somebody told me I couldn't do it. So now if I did that, I'm not bragging, because I'm just a big flat-footed old barn guy right now. I'm telling you, if I could do that, I'm just a 250-pound hunk of protoplasm trying to make a difference in your life. I'm no better than you. I'm just a hunk of cells speaking to you right now from this stage. You see, I'm a biology teacher. But I'm sharing with you right now, if you have problems, issues, concerns, we have superstars right here in this school in Shepherd that are willing to help take you to the next level. So we got this great cocoon in here called the school, and out there into the real world, you can go from being a caterpillar to a butterfly and light up the world. I want you to all know that life is fun if you make it fun. You can sit there and say, oh, I'm blind. <laughs> I get a big nose too, and every time I drink a latte, my nose gets ripped in my Which it does, by the way. Every time I drink a latte, I get a big nose. Yeah? My grandson thinks it's a cave. He wants to climb in there. I got to get him out. It's unbelievable. So some of us are not blessed with great looks. You know? I mean, I love my black hair. You mean it's white? I'll tell you what, I'm having fun. I can tell each of you right now, every one of us is imperfect. We're all imperfect. But let me ask you a question. Well, I'm not perfect, you guys got problems. Let me tell you something. Don't ever feel like you're not worth something. You're extremely valuable. You're priceless. Now, I'm not just saying that, I can prove it. You see, I'm a scientist, and I can prove what I'm saying. You're priceless. A masterpiece is something that's worth millions of dollars, because how many of them are there in the world, a masterpiece? One. For instance, how many of you have heard of the Mona what? Mona Lisa. It's now in France. It's a small painting of what Leonardo da Vinci supposedly painted. Some people say he was doing a self-portrait. Some people say he was the most beautiful woman in the world. I have a picture of the Mona Lisa right here. Check this bit. Come on, Mona. There it is. Can you see that? Is it right side up? Yeah. She's doing a headstand. Okay. Right side up. That's the Mona Lisa. According to, accordingly, back in the Middle Ages or whatever, the Renaissance period, they said she was the most beautiful woman in the world. I'm glad I'm blind. <laughs> if she doesn't look like George Washington with a black wig on, who does? If you take one dollar out of your pocket and look at it, it's George. But the Mona Lisa, one time, was auctioned for $52 million. Now let's see how smart this group is. If somebody said, hey, uh, Charlie, you got the Mona Lisa in your, in your office, the real one. I'll give you $52 million for that. How many of you say, no, thank you? How many of us would sell this thing for $52 million? Say, I. Uh, get that ugly thing off my wall and give me the kid. Well, I tell you what, but this is still a masterpiece. And what does this have to do with you? Watch this. Piece of, piece of cake to prove. This masterpiece is one of a kind in the universe. If I go to the Mona Lisa and say, hey Mona, how's it going today? You know what she says? <laughs> Nothing. Mona, what's up today? What are you doing? How the kids? <laughs> Nothing. But if I say to you, hey guys, how's it going today? You doing all right? Yeah, it's okay. You can speak to me, you can change, you can grow, you can evolve, you can change the world. You're more valuable than the Mona Lisa. So here's my question. 52 million bucks. How many of you would like to own a masterpiece? Say I. 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 Well, you do. And it's sitting in your chair right now. Now some of you look and say, where? I can't see it. It's you. You're worth more than the Mona Lisa, because you're one of a kind. There's only one of you in the entire universe. There's only one of me. My mother said, thank God. <laughs> if I was twins, she would have jumped off a bridge. But you know what? There is only one of me in the world. I had somebody once from Cable News Network, when I won Teacher of the Year, and I'll explain that in a minute, came up to me, because I'm totally blind, and said, you know, you're doing some research now where they can look amniocentetically into this womb and find out if babies are going to have your eye disease, Rich, 
in the womb so women can have a, women can have a choice whether to abort or not. If my mother in 1950 had a choice to have me go into the world or not, I know she would have had me go into the world. That was her belief. But think about this. Who are we to say that any imperfection is not? Here's what I saw to the cameras. Who are we as men to decide which of us imperfect humans has the right to live? And how can you quantify one imperfection versus another since no one's perfect? Yeah, I'm blind, but I believe I've helped change the world. Over 100 million people have seen me on television sharing my testimony and my story that life's not over when adversity strikes. You keep turning pages till better chapters lie ahead. Because remember, I was the worst teacher in the world. I'm a blind guy that went blind and coached javelin throws. That doesn't even make sense. In 1995, on television, I was named Disney and McDonald's American Teacher Award Coach of the Year for the United States, and I'm blind, and an Outstanding Teacher of the Year for the United States, 20 to 32 years, excuse me, 32 years, 22 years after my first principal said I was the worst teacher in the world, I was named Outstanding Teacher of the Year for the United States. Now, I tell you that not to brag. I tell you that to make me be a reference point and a signpost and a guidepost in your life. You met a blind guy that came to your school on May the 9th, 2013, who was the worst teacher in the world, who was a blind guy coaching spear throws, who became Teacher of the Year for the United States and Outstanding Coach of the Year in the same program for the United States of America, who's now inducted, by the way, into the National Teachers Hall of Fame. I tell you that because if I can do it, so can you. What makes my imperfection any more impressive than yours? You have an issue, you have a problem, you have a need, guess what? We got super coaches who possess rules and recipes for your success. Take advantage of it. And when you become a success from that, five, ten, whatever years from now, remember these folks here, stop by and let them know how you're doing. And then you can speak to the students just like I'm doing right now and share your story and make an impact and pay it back and pay it forward for all the blessings that have been bestowed upon you for all the assistance we have here. You know, one-sixth of the world's population, children, are starving right now as we speak. In some countries in the world, in Central America, in Guatemala, Honduras, and places like that, some kids' life expectancy when they're orphans is no greater than two to three years before they're dead. So as bad as we all think it is right now, it's not so bad. It's just a frame of reference. Of course, we only know our own pain, and we only know our own pity. But when we stop saying, poor me, and start saying, watch me, we'll get the world's attention. I'm going to see if we've got some champions in this room. You know, you can say, poor me, or you can say, watch me. I want to know what kind of people we have right here. When I say, when the world says you can, champions say, I want you to say, watch me, really loud. When the world says you can, champions say, watch me. Champions say, watch me. You can do better than that. Champions say, watch me. That's right. And champions see their finish line as the next starting line. What do you mean by that? Don't do something great and say, see how great I am? <laughs> that was yesterday. What are you going to do tomorrow? You're only as good as your next performance. You know, as a speaker, I can come here and do a knockout speech. Well, that's great. What if I come back next year? Ancient history. If, you're not, if you don't hit a home run every time, it's not worth anything. You're only as good as your last performance and your last achievement and your last trophy. You know what I want to do? My expression for me, I want my moniker, my epitaph to say, dying, trying. That's me. I am not a great actor. Well, one guy, I'll tell you right now, I'm not a great teacher. You know why I became one? Because somebody told me I couldn't. They challenged me. Instead of punching somebody in the face and going off, I proved them wrong. So in your life, the best way to channel anger, frustration, disturbance, 
a feeling of self-worthlessness, lack of confidence, and poor self-esteem is to believe in you and to prove the world wrong and make something of yourself. You know, another reason I did this, when I was going blind, my mother and father felt guilty because they transferred a genetic disease to me that they didn't even know they had. It wasn't their fault. It's just dumb luck. My mother was on the phone talking to an aunt of mine. Little Italian ladies tend to say miserable things to each other. My one aunt was saying, oh, Aunt Lulu's toe fell off from diabetes. <laughs> oh, really? Charlie had a triple bypass. They're having a conference like a tennis match. Who's got worse news than what? Oh, really? Yeah, Aunt Susie's dog chewed her, to chewed her arm off yesterday and ate the newspaper. Really? And my mother said, my son's going blind. She won. I'm in the other room here, my mother do this competition and used me as the smashing trump card. My son's going blind. They gave up. They let her win the misery contest. The show, Les Miserables, had my mother's pink face on there, on the marquee, and she had me winning. And I'm in the other room saying, if the way the world remembers me is that I went blind and how terrible it is, what a horrible life that is. Can you imagine? Was born, went blind, and died. Wow, that's exciting. <laughs> Magic, let's go see that movie. It's really uplifting. Are you kidding me? I'm into the Rocky thing. Knock me out. Let me stand up. I never give up. I get up. Pow! And I'm Rocky, baby. And the movie ends. Someday if they do a movie about my life, and you see a big ugly Italian guy with a giant nose that's blind, that was me. But I want everybody to watch that movie and see themselves because I'm no better than anyone in this room. And I'm using me as an example of you. I'm a giant mirror right now of all of you. Ladies, that must be exciting. <laughs> My daughter once brought me to this place and said, Dad, your eyebrows look nasty. They look like a giant bridge across your head. <laughs> My daughter's so nice. By the way, in about a week, I want you to say a prayer. She's supposed to graduate from Virginia Tech next week against all odds and have learning disabilities to boot. She's an example of what you folks may possess. She took me to the hair place. I, I, that's not my thing. She says, yeah. and then the girl started rubbing my hand and giving me a show. Oh, this feels good. And then, oh, that, oh, baby. I'm laying back like this. Next thing you know, she went, yeah, oh. She pulled my eyes. She said, She pulled my eyes. What's going on here? They're killing me. You ladies are tough. Ladies go to their own purpose. I'm getting my eyebrows on No, thank you. Go kill me. It's a tough life. You know, you've got to enjoy life. Even an eyebrow waxing can be a funny experience. See, I felt like my whole life, my whole body was waxed. Thrown down and stomped on by a giant gorilla that hated Italian guys. You know what? That movie ends, the guy gets up and beats the gorilla. You've heard the story, the 800 pound gorilla in the room, get out of my room. This is my room. My daughter, when I was going through a tough time when I got hurt and couldn't teach anymore, I was pretty depressed, believe it or not. Imagine me depressed, and I was. I was sitting in my funk, feeling sorry for myself because I couldn't teach. I couldn't have my audience. I couldn't do my thing. I couldn't share my message about hopefulness, and I was hopeless. My daughter got me a little statue. Yeah, you know I said I punch punching days. And my favorite animals are the gorillas. I kind of look like one. She gave me a little gorilla wearing boxing gloves. And I had a little sign on it that said, Tough times don't last. Tough people do. So I want you to remember that right now. That tough times don't last. But tough people do. You may be having a tough time in your life right now. You may be having something in your heart right now. You may not be a happy camper right now. I wish you weren't here at this moment. You may have things heavy on your heart that home problems that you don't even want to share with anybody and personal issues that are too big to explain. But I want you to know that there are people here that care about you. They went to school for years, went to college, got masters and doctoral degrees for years just to have the opportunity to help bless you and move you to the, move you to the next level. And that is awesome. So I want you to take a newfound look at your teachers and the staff here. This is not a paid commercial. Give them a newfound look that they are here to assist me and guide me on my pathway 
to success. Yeah, and some of you may be in an intercept in a tough time and a crossroads, but they possess the traffic signals that can turn your red light to a green light and help you move forward. And guys like me, yeah, I come in once a year, I give a, a speech, I get fired up and feel like I'm 15 years old for a few minutes. Then when it's all over and I stop sweating, I realize I'm 62 and everything hurts. But right now you've got my adrenaline pumping because I do miss teaching. Teaching has always been my life. And if I sound like I'm getting choked up, it's because I am. And this is great therapy for me too, my friends. I come here every year and realize that this is what my gift has always been to share myself with you, to let you know that if I can do it, you can do it too. I may be blind, but I see perfectly. I have a vision that the future of America and the world is sitting right in front of me here in Shepherd. And I want to give you, and they want to give you the teachers everything you need, every tool you need to possess to build a monument that will stand the test of time, to give you a good reputation and a tremendous body of work after you leave here that will make your family and your future children proud of you. So that's why I come here today. Now, I wasn't planning on doing a big, long, explosive thing. It just kind of happened. I don't have a script written down. I don't have a teleprompter. I can't see a thing. If I wrote stuff down on a little piece of paper, I couldn't see it. It really doesn't matter. But I'll tell you right now, it's always a pleasure to come here to share. And I want to share with you, there is nobody in this room that isn't worth our total attention and full investment of time into your future. Because you're awesome. I want you to do me a favor right now. Dr. Hart, are you available for consultation? Yeah, Can you come up here for a minute? Well, thank you. What a great group. You guys are pumping me up. Okay, I want you to do me a favor. Okay, you want to take a look at me. I want you, you guys, and some of you know what we do here, but we do it again, because it always works. I want you to raise your right hand up as high as you can right now, and Dr. Hart, can you be the eyes once? And let me be the brain of this time. Put your hands up high. Some of you with tank tops on, hmm, little deodorant. <laughs> Mr. Flavio, come on, put that hand up. Put that skinny little arm up in the air. Okay. Your hand up as high as you can. If I say it as high as you can, I want you to knock my socks off loudly and say yes. Is it as high as you can? Yes. Is it as high as you can? Yes. Can you do better than that? Is it as high as you can? Yes. Do me a favor. Watch this, Dr. Hockey. Put a quarter inch higher. Flavio, quarter inch higher. How'd they do that? You did it. You know what you proved? Give yourselves a round of applause. Yes.